All right, welcome back to Chaos, Fractals, and Dynamics, uh, based on the work of Robert L. Devaney, Dr. Robert L. Devaney, who wrote a little book in 1989, 1990, it was published on this topic. Uh, it, was, it serves as a good textbook for this course, if you want to find it on the internet. Um, and today, what we're going to do, you remember we've been iterating on f of x equals x squared plus c, where c has been a parameter that went over the entire reals, and we examine what happened when we did this iteration. Uh, the first big question is, was, uh, does the orbit of the iteration escape or not? And we discovered that sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, that the region between negative 2 and 0.25 uh, is the important region where things happen. And outside of that, um, it always escapes. Inside of that, it uh, does not escape. And uh, various things happen in there as well. Sometimes it settles down on one number or approaches one number. Sometimes it's a two cycle. Sometimes it's a hundred cycle. Sometimes we can't figure out what's going on. And we call that chaos. Uh, today, what we'd like to do is find an even better way than a histogram for visualizing this. And uh, the way we're going to do that is with something called a web diagram. Now, interestingly enough, these are built into your uh, TIE for calculators, and almost nobody uses it. Uh, I think it was in the original TI-82s, anyway. Uh, and um, that's probably because it's a little clunky to use, and it's kind of slow. But uh, GeoGebra does a pretty good job of this, even though you have to program it to do it. So we're going to do it with GeoGebra, get a really, really nice uh, set of visual results. Okay, so let's start out and see how we develop this. To do this, we're going to do something by hand. And then we're going to, uh, well, actually, we're going to use our calculator. So you might want to get your calculator out if you want to do this along with me. What we're going to do, we're going to start out, as always, with a seed of uh, x equals 0. And we're going to iterate, and we're going to use c equal 0.5 as an example. f of x equals x squared plus 0.5. And we're going to do a bunch of iterations. So our first iteration we're going to do, obviously, is going to be f of, um, I'm going to plug in 0. f of 0 equals um, 0 squared plus 0.5, so it would be 0.5. And n is the number of iterations over here. And our first answer is 0.5. And on my calculator, I'm doing that. You may remember I plugged in 0, and then I put answer squared plus 0.5, and I hit Enter got 0.5. If I hit enter again, that gives me my second iter iteration. So n equals 2, and I get 0.75 for that. And uh, let me introduce a little notation. You see this fn up here? If I wanted to say what f2 is, that doesn't mean f squared. It doesn't mean the second derivative. It just means the value of the second iteration. So I could put f2 equals 0.75, and anybody who knows the nomenclature would understand what I was saying. So it's a nice short, easy to write notation to indicate the value of a particular iteration. So then I hit enter again on my calculator and I get 1.0625. So my third iteration is 1.0625. And um, one more time and I get uh, my fourth iteration is 1.6, about 1.6289. And one more time, I'm going to get my fifth iteration. And my fifth iteration is 3.1533. Okay, and I can see now that my number has gone beyond 2 that this is going to diverge. But I knew that anyway, because I know with any value of c greater than 0.25, I'm going to get divergence or escape. So why did we do this? Well, let's just see. Here's what we got. Here's what we do every time we iterate. This is an important concept. When we iterate, we have a function f of x, and we plug in a value of x. So, we, for instance, we might have f of x zero, and that gives us uh, a new value x one, and we plug x one back into there. Okay. Well, basically what we're doing, of course, is we're getting f of f 
of x0. That's another way of, of, of looking at it. Uh, we're just getting the function over and over and over again. Um, and we would write that for short, pan f2 of x0. But what's really important here, another way to look at it is you say, okay, we're, getting, we're starting with y equals some function of x. Okay? y equals some function of x is what we have originally. We're plugging in, and we're getting a value for y, and then we're taking that value of y, and we're plugging it in for x. We're replacing x by our answer, which is y. Okay? And the way to write that, a way to write that, an equation is x equals y. And you say, I would write that as y equals x. Why are you writing that as x equals y? Well, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you on this diagram. See that picture up there with the red curve? The red curve is x squared plus c. Now, everybody knows y equals x squared is a parabola. x squared plus c is just a parabola that's been raised up at amount c. Uh, so x squared plus 0.5. Notice it's, uh, the vertex is now at 0.5. What I'm doing when I plug in all these numbers and get this table over here, I'm starting with 0. I'm plugging in. I'm getting 0.5. See that? My first iteration. And then I'm plugging 0.5 in for x. Plugging 0.5 in for x. Well, let's see what this means. This is kind of cool. Watch this. One way to do that is to say, okay, 0.5 is y, but if I come over here to the x equals y place, that's the same thing as setting x equal to y, because that is the line y equals x. So if I want my new x graphically, the equivalent of plugging in x for y, or y for x rather, is to come over to that line and go down to the x-axis. Then I go up Take my new value of x, which is 0.5, plug it in, right, f of 0.5, did that on my calculator, and I get 0.75. That's right there. Okay? Then I come over, and I say, oh, 0.75, that's what I want to plug in next. That's my new x. To find the y with the x, you go up to the curve, and so on. Well, you notice, it's really not necessary to drop down to the x-axis because you're going to go up anyway. So what you have to simulate this y equals x or x equals y or this iteration pattern, all you need is like a stair step. Okay, every time you iterate, basically what you're doing is starting with an x, going up to the curve to get your y, setting x equal to y, going up to your curve to get your y, setting x equal to y, on ad infinitum ad nauseum. Okay? So that's the way you can graphically do the kind of iteration we've been doing. And you can look at it and see that it escapes because you're stair-stepping to heaven. You're going off to infinity. And what we want to do is look at this and play with it and change the value of C and see when it doesn't escape and even understand why 0.25 is the place where it doesn't escape. So, I'm excited about that. Let's do that right now. Okay, here's the picture we just had. And notice we have five iterations, just like we did. And I didn't go any further. I could do more, but it's just going to go off. As you can see, the last value is going to get really big, and it's off the screen, and I don't really care about that. Let's just keep the number of iterations small to begin with. I'm always going to start with my seed of zero. I can change the seed here if I want, but we like the seed of zero. Okay, it's an easy seed to use. I'm going to take my C and I'm going to reduce it. Now, you remember we did this in a couple of different ways in the previous lessons. As I change the value of C, graphically what happens, of course, is the curve comes down. The curve comes down. Let's put, the, let's put f of x over here. There it is, x squared plus 0.43. The y-intercept is 0.43. And so I just keep on changing that, and something interesting begins to happen. The curve, the red curve, 
is getting closer and closer to touching the line x equals y. And when it touches it, you know where that point is? Yes, indeed, it's 0.25. And at that point, it's, it's, I guess we could call it, what it's called in engineering is a pinch point when you're doing web diagrams with um, uh, distillation columns. And the pinch point is, is a point where the curve pinches off the line, and at that point, you can't get beyond the curve. And when you can't get beyond and move off to the right, you can't get to the right of the curve, uh, you've got a pinch point, and that pinch point means that things have to converge at that point. And so you can see our stair step. Our stair step is kind of small there. It goes up, 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 and you can't see it. But I'm putting a lot of iterations here. And as I put my iterations, whoops, as I put my iterations, that moves closer and closer. See, it's moving closer and closer to 0 0.5, but it is never, ever going to reach 0 0.5. Let's, let's go over here and Let's allow ourselves to go to a thousand here just to see. A thousand iterations. Okay, it doesn't matter how far I go, I never really reach 0.5. You say, oh yes, you did. But you know as well as I do that if we go here rounding, and go to like 15 decimal places, we haven't quite reached it. We're getting closer and closer to it. But here you can see, for the first time, this is the first model we've had. And you can see that the stair step is truly asymptotically approaching some number, and that number is 0.5. We can prove that it's 0.5 by simply taking the equation of the curve and taking the equation of the line and finding their intersection there. Isn't that cool? All right, and we'll do that later on, but not right now. So what happens as C gets smaller? Let me leave my, let's make my number of iterations smaller again. Get them down there to... 30 or so. Well, as C gets smaller, you remember we still have convergence. See the convergence? But the convergence when we reach here, notice something interesting is happening. Instead of it going directly to it, it kind of goes around it there. It gets a little above the line, a little below, moves left and right and left and right, and homes in on that region. Okay? Homes in on that region. And we are indeed getting convergence. You say it's kind of hard to see. All right, let's see if we can do something about that. Uh, maybe I can go to, uh, since the action is all in this region here, maybe I can go to my graphics and I, c I can change things. Uh, so, I'm not sure what's going on there. X min is, oh, it must be decimal point. Oh, yeah. So let's make our X min negative 2.1 because we're not really interested in less than negative 2. And let's make my x max 2. Uh, let's make my x max 0.3 because we don't care about anything off of 0.25. Uh, and let's make my y min negative 2. And my y max 2. And let's just see what that looks like. There we go. Alright. Uh, all the action in here. Okay, and you can see it's homing in. Uh, now, as C moves further down to the left, remember the big, the important point was negative 0.75? Watch it now. Notice, I've still got a two cycle. Still have a two cycle. Watch it. I'm sorry, I still have a one cycle. I'm still homing in on a point. You see I'm homing in on that point? Watch it. There it is. Homes in on the point. Now, as I hit negative 0.75, suddenly taking a long, long time. Let's go to negative 0.76. All right, number of iterations. Notice it has settled down, and it's a two cycle. The way I can tell it's a two cycle is see two points, two points on that line. Those are points where y equals x. And when y equals x, and you repeat it, those are the cycles. So all I have to do is read off those numbers. Looks like that's negative 0.6, the last value, negative 0.6. And that one over there is about negative 0.4. So my two cycle 
for c equals negative 0.76 is alternating between those two numbers. Okay, that still looks kind of ugly. So what I'm going to do, is I'm going to go back to a, um, the previous um, screen situation. Um, see if I can do that by just clicking up here, going back. Oh, doesn't like that at all. Um, all right, well, I'm going to grab it, pull it, and I'm going to go to my graphics here. And I'm going to go negative 2, 2, and negative 2 to 2. Just to make it look nicer. There we go. Okay. Now as I move C to the left, remember, I expect my two cycle to continue until I reach, what is it, negative 1.25? And there's my eventual two cycle. It's an eventual two cycle because you see right away it's not a two cycle. It takes its time. Okay, and now it's going between values there. And the last value here. Okay, watch the values. Watch the, watch the values change. This is a two cycle. Negative 0.125 over and over again. Why is that? Oh, because my iterations aren't changing. All right, here we go. 521. There we go. Negative 0.125, negative 0.87. Two cycle, very clearly. Eventually gets to the two cycle. And I can see the two cycle there. That's what's cool. I don't care about the numbers so much as seeing it. And at one point, negative 1.25, Notice it's now shifted to a four cycle. If I take my iterations and I change them, watch the last values. They cycle among four different numbers. Okay, four different numbers there. All right, you can see the last point I'm on there. These points in here were previous points. I haven't erased them, so you, they're still sitting there getting in the way. But you can see that's a four cycle. Now watch four cycle eventually is going to, you know what it's going to do, it's going to bifurcate, there's a clean four cycle there, it's going to bifurcate, and when it bifurcates, we're going to get, count them, an eight cycle, find the eight places where the web diagram intersects y equals x, and those will be the eight different um, points that it is approaching those that's part of the eighth cycle all right now if there's an eight cycle there must be a 16 cycle and then things get crazy as you can see that's a region negative 1.43 i'd be tempted to call that a region of chaos no matter how many iterations i get it just is not going to settle down okay now Here we go. Look at that. Suddenly, negative 1.48. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That could be a 7 cycle. I told you, remember, there are cycles of every possible integer. Because numbers, they don't bifurcate at the same time, so sometimes you get one of them bifurcating a little earlier than the other, one of the points. So that's, that's what's going on there. Oh, and suddenly we're back into chaos. And there's some serious chaos. And it looks pretty cool when you animate it. Got to tell you, watch this. Here we go. Animation on. Yeah. See, it's getting bigger now. Tell you what, let's uh, bring it all the way down and let it go backwards. So we're going to start at, oh, yeah, we're going to start at point nine or so and bring it on down. Escaping one cycle. One cycle, one cycle, bifurcation is coming up pretty soon, right about there. Yeah, well, all right. Bifurcate again at negative 1.25. Watch it. We got a two cycle now. Here it comes. Negative 1.2, negative 1.25. Yes. 
Okay, and now it goes crazy pretty fast. Okay, there's the dramatic illustration of a couple of things. One is the onset of chaos. Two is, and this is part of chaos, incredible sensitivity to initial conditions. A very slight change in C, you can see, makes a tremendous, tremendous difference in what's happening in that graph. You've got nutty, crazy stuff right there. Here we're coming back from negative two. I mean, that is true chaos. And suddenly, just for a blink there, we're out of chaos. And then we're in and out of it again. It's very, very unpredictable. And that's one of the things that makes this study so important in realistic things as well as, as, well as fun in mathematics. This incredible sensitivity to initial conditions is something that needs to be studied because it's important in a lot of things. Okay, that's our web diagram. Uh, I'll find one later on, an old one that I've got, that allows us to uh, to get rid of like the first few hundred iterations so you can see what's really happening without having them being in the way. Okay, so that's an illustration of how a web diagram can be used to do iteration, to show iteration in a very dramatic way without worrying about the numbers. You can see what's going on. And this can be used for other things, too. This is not just obviously not just confined to uh, this function we're looking at. All sorts of functions can be used for it. If you're, uh, if you're looking at one of those diagrams in economics, um, where you've got those, the lines that indicate, uh, what is it, supply and demand? Okay, and when they try to explain that, they really don't tell you that one of the best ways to explain it is by web diagramming it. Actually, one of the lines is um, related to the other in such a way that sometimes the web diagram will go off and sometimes it'll converge. So this is a pretty important concept for understanding what's going on. Very important tool. It's not a concept, it's a tool for understanding what's going on in a lot of math and science. Okay. And that's all we're going to do today on this. So we now have seen how to illustrate iteration on a function, in particular the function f of x equals x squared plus c with a seed, s-e-e-d, of a zero. And we've looked at it uh, in several ways. Uh, we've just plugged in the numbers and seen what's happened, looking at the numbers. We've done a histogram, which gives us a really nice picture of what's going on. And now we've done a cobweb, or a web diagram, which really dramatically shows the transition to chaos. So we're almost ready to push on and talk about how all this relates to the very famous, although very new, uh, set in mathematics called the Mandelbrot set. And by the way, the uh, question often comes up, how do you pronounce Mandelbrot? Uh, Mandelbrot pronounced it Mandelbrot when he was speaking in English, hanging around the United States. When he was speaking French or Flemish, not French, I think, uh, he would pronounce it Mandelbro. At least that's what I've read. So you can't go wrong. Either way is right, if if my sources are correct. Okay, that's all. Lesson four is over. See you at lesson five.